So we're just about time. Let's begin with our little period of quiet meditation and motivation. I'm sitting on a cushion, so I try to sit cross-legged and I, uh, so main thing is to have your spine straight. Check your posture occasionally. Eyes partially open, hands in your lap. And place your attention, first of all, on the breathing in front. Once you've recognized it, it becomes a use the mental factor mindfulness to keep it in mind. Let go of everything else. Once your respiration has reached a nice rhythm, subtle rhythm, and you're not multitasking, you're not thinking of other things, leave your attention away from, take your attention away from the respiration, and instead look at your mental consciousness. And the way that, as we said so many times, you do that is to watch its contents, first of all, because the mental consciousness is something very subtle. If there are fears or anticipation, good or bad anticipation, memories, plans, just observations about the present or the mind scattering onto other topics. Whatever they are, learn to disengage your attention to them. So that they are not fueled they don't become more intense and in fact, they begin to dissipate.
to the point where you start to see some spaciousness between the thoughts. And the first step is to try to focus on that spaciousness. As in the process of developing single pointed concentration, if you were to visualize the Buddha, for instance, in front, you would try to keep a continuity of that visualization. So here you try to keep a continuity of the recognition of that spaciousness of the mind. and recognize its essential quality of being non-obstructing. It doesn't hinder thoughts from coming in, entering, or doesn't hinder them from leaving. It doesn't have a color. It's not black, as you might imagine with your eyes partially closed. It's not the color of sky, you know, sky blue or something. It's known by your mental factor of wisdom. Let go of the perhaps still appearing or sense of your body, the looming sense of your body. That's being perceived by your tactile consciousness, but your mental consciousness has an awareness of that that's appearing to your mental consciousness. Recognize the spaciousness of the mind within it, which that is appearing. And instead of focusing on the object the body, focus on the subject mind that's perceiving it, the subject spaciousness of the mind that it, within which it's appearing. Often we would go a step further in recognizing the sense of a subject, yourself, the I, as observing the mind, and we would let go of that. But here, as we're going to investigate the logic of establishing emptiness today, try to recognize how the I appears the sense of I, me. What we're looking to recognize is the, what's called the innate form of that. Something that's not due to transient conditions you know, recognizing your body. If someone says you're, you've gained some weight, I'm thinking, you know, I'm my body. Or someone says how slim or handsome or attractive you look. Not that. Not something associated with your mind. You know, I'm clever or I'm stupid or.
but think of something dynamic that brings up your sense of ego. If you've been praised or more dynamically, if you've been abused in some way, you're a liar. Someone has said that to you. You're not trustworthy. You're a thief. See how the mind reacts to that. There is a glimpse perhaps of the appearance to your mind, a sense of I. Existing from its own side. Not the body, not the mind. Someone says, you're a thief. You don't think my body is a thief. My mind is a thief. You think, I have been accused of being a thief. If you have great longing for a friend or great antipathy, antipathy towards someone, bring that to mind for an instant. In the laboratory of your mind, you might say, why, why should I be practicing attachment or anger or antipathy? Here you're doing it in a controlled setting in the laboratory of your mind. The eye is an autonomous observer of your mind, that, that eye, the eye that is the meditator. See if you can sense how that appears to the mind in the sense, not, not in the visual sense of appearance, but how, how that is impacting upon your mind and also how your mind reacts to that. That is to say, does the mind accept that as true? Does it assent to that appearance? I think this is the, if we've, if we've gotten a clear view of that, this is what's called the innate conception of the I. It's the mind's reaction, the innate appearance of the object of negation. This is the first essential step in a logical procedure to refute the eye, to prove it logically, prove logically that it does not exist the way that it appears. It's called recognizing the object of negation. And feeling some joy in having the opportunity to do this due to the fact that we have a life of leisure endowment as a result of karma we've created in past lives. 
how this life is fragile and fleeting, decaying in the shortest instant. And the fact that up till now we have not spent that much of our life in the practice of Dharma. So to try to use what life we have now, where we have this acuity of mind, faith in the Dharma, the Dharma existing in the world, teachers to explain it, spiritual friends, community, Sangha to help us take the medicine of the Dharma. I think I'm going to participate this morning to use this perfect human life to familiarize my mind with the three principles of the path, especially the wisdom that realizes emptiness, not with the goal of just getting a degree or a, you know, some interesting facts to mention at a cocktail party, but to change myself, to become better, to be able to vanquish my enemies, my true enemies, the delusions, anger, attachment, ignorance, especially the ignorance that grasps to the inherent existence of the self. And that in turn would as a stepping stone to achieve liberation and enlightenment out of an empathy and compassion for all sentient beings who've been my mother, who've been kind even when not my mother, who are exactly equal to me in wanting to be free of suffering, wanting to be happy. As a hero or heroine, to lead them out of suffering into happiness, ultimate happiness, we ourselves have to achieve enlightenment. So it's for that purpose, I'm going to participate this morning in the class. I'm going to participate, listen, contemplate, meditate in order to achieve enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. That's my agenda. So bring your attention back to the present. And good morning, everyone. Some people joining Manuel, Susie, Anna, Nadine, Annie, Alex. I think I said hello to the rest before. Larry Heath is there in the middle. Larry, what's that on your, your lap? Oh, I thought that was a special cushion. Huh? Yeah. So any, any observation or question about uh, this added factor to our motivation meditation this morning, trying to recognize the object of negation? Matthew, do you have, you're looking to unmute? Oh, okay. Has anyone, is, is that the fir first time that you've heard that? Alex, do you have a, have a thought? Yes, thank you. Um, just wondering about that word negation. Um, and uh, yeah, just trying to understand the object of negation. Is it something we are negating something that's already negated, uh, just how to understand that. Right. And you could also translate it as the object of refutation that we're going to refute, that we're going to negate. So what it means is it's something that we are attempting 
to understand uh, that it does not exist. So negate in that, that sense. Say, if someone accuses you, say, if you're a political, if you're a politician, and someone accuses you of, um, you know, stealing money or sexual improprieties or all the kinds of things that people are accused of. Uh, and you would want to refute that accusation. You would want to prove that it's not true so that, of course, you you yourself believe it's not true. Hopefully it's, it's not true. Hopefully you don't, you don't know that you've been stealing money and, and, and you know, being naughty and so forth. But in order to uh, change the minds of others so that they don't believe that either, you would try to refute that accusation. Could, would you agree that that would be, could you understand how the refutation could be used in the meaning there? Who'd ask the question? I can't remember. Was it Alexis? Yeah, it was, it was Alex. Yeah. Alex, um, yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I can see how uh, it's almost like disproving something. Yes. In fact, yeah. Um, so here, you, if you say negate, uh, it can have, it has the same sense. So uh, there are two objects to be refuted, to be proved, uh, hmm, or say refuted in the sense of refuting the existence, say for instance, the appearance of the eye, you don't refute, you're not, you're not trying to prove that the appearance doesn't exist because the eye, the sense of eye does appear to your mind, right? You know, but what you want to refute is the underlying sense that there is something really there. Say for instance, um, I've given this example, I think here and other places when we talked in, at Trip to Norberling in the last year or so. Um, my friend once in India had gone to, uh, wanted to go to a nice hotel, but she had been traveling sweaty and the buses and old clothes. She couldn't get into the good hotel. So she first went to a second rate hotel to take a shower and put on good clothes. Then she goes to the nice, to the Hilton or whatever it is, the Sheridan in Delhi and, uh, as she's walking, she has her nice, you know, fancy clothes on. She's walking in and out of the corner of her eye, she sees what appears to be another person, another lady in the same dress. I don't know, you guys are more practical, the ladies here. The men generally don't care that much if someone else has the same outfit. But I'm just, excuse me if, I sound, if that sounds... Uh, uh, was it sexist or something like that? Just giving you an example. So she's she's looking out of the side of her eye, and uh, thinks that there's someone there, and sort of some uh, indignation or, or maybe surprise or whatever. So she looks and she sees that it's her reflection in one of these big uh, glass doors. You know how the big hotels they have these big uh, glass doors, and you sometimes forms a very clear reflection. So she was actually seeing herself. And at that moment, she realized that um, she didn't realize that there was no reflection there. She saw the reflection, but she realized it was devoid of what she was believing it to be. Another lady in the same dress, other than herself. So she's, she's not, ref, she wasn't, ref, she didn't refute or negate the existence of the reflection or the appearance. So in, in this case, we're not refuting the appearance of the eye. It does appear, but we're refuting what it seemed to be, what it seems to be, something actually existing there. One of the factors that can help to understand that is just in our everyday life, seeing how often things appear one way and we understand that upon investigation that they are not that way. Say for instance, uh, in a dream, 
seems so clear and obvious. Uh, what was I dreaming this morning? Uh, I was dreaming, somehow it made sense in the dream that I was trying to do my prayers in my dream. And I was, I was counting which verses I'd finished by cutting up cake. So it seemed, seemed so clear at the time, you know, oh, now I've got that, that part finished. I cut another slice or something like that, a brownies or something. Don't ask me where that came from. I do like, I, I do like those crunchy kind of things, but maybe that's part of it. But uh, upon awaking, awakening, I realized that uh, not only had I, had I not been doing my prayers, I just thought I was doing my prayers, but I was, uh, you know, what appeared like that I was keeping track of it by this. Uh, although it appeared so clearly and previously I was believing that, I recognized upon awakening that didn't, didn't exist at all. Or like a nightmare being chased by a dog. Or uh, the, what's the famous one? Uh, going in for your final exam in college, sitting down and realize that you haven't studied all year. Have you ever had that one? There's some, there's some other classic ones. So uh, using a dream as an example or an illusion, um, sometimes in the movie theater, this is a very good example. Um, you might get caught up, or even on TV, you might caught, get caught up in some uh, story. You know, you're rooting for someone or someone has been cheated and you're, you're even crying as though this is real, real. Uh, you know, a drama on TV. Um, Kurti Senshaw Brimbache, one of the great teachers in our group of tradition who passed away some years ago, he used to say, you know, when his attendants would be watching these Kung Fu movies when he was on tour and people would say, oh, Brimbache, should, they shouldn't be watching TV and so forth. And he said, no, there's, there's a benefit, um, you know, when you watch these things, because if you, if you, if you stand back and look, you see, you know, this is all a projection on the screen. Let's say in a movie theater, you can say that the, the light is coming from the projector behind you or on TV is coming, you know, it's, it's being projected there. It's not real in the way that it appears. And if you stand back sometime, you can, you can, you can let go of your emotional reaction to that. So recognizing that there are things in our experience that appear, but do not exist the way that they appear. And there's a myriad uh, number of examples. The Buddha in his teachings gave about a dozen uh, examples of things that appear, but are empty of existing the way they appear. Can you, can you understand how I'm using the word empty here? Like say, uh, let's say, in the distance there's a pile of stones in uh, in the English countryside when you're out walking. What's it called when you're walking? And I can't remember. Not trekking. What do the British say? They're going out for rambling. Rambling. Okay, you're rambling, right? You're rambling, and in the distance, you oh my, there's another rambler. You wave. There's no re there's no response. And as you get closer and closer, or you take out your binoculars, whatever, you recognize that it, it is a pile of stones, uh, which is quite prominent in the English countryside, to, you know, demarcation between uh, property lines and things like that. Uh, this is called a Karen. Am I pronouncing that right? Karen or Karen? Karen? James is nodding. Yeah, that's not another. So, Although it appeared to be a person, when you investigated more deeply, you got closer, so to speak, um, you recognized it was devoid of being a person. It's, it's, it still appeared, but it was empty of or devoid of the attribution that you were making to it that that was a person. Same thing with uh, an illusion or a dream. So. Knowing that, you can understand how there can be the appearance of an eye to your mind, 
that seems to be inherently existent, but it may not, that it may not exist in a way. It's possible, but you, you still might have doubt. And maybe, you know, maybe it doesn't exist. It looks, sure, looks like it exists. Again, not looking with your eye, but it seems to your mental consciousness that it exists. Uh, you can still have a doubt. But this is the first step in uh, logically establishing emptiness, or another way of saying, logically proving that this self that we've been believing in since beginningless time, proving that it does not exist that way. So there's another factor here. Uh, there's the appearance of the eye, and then there's the way that the mind reacts to that appearance. And you, you, you'll get, you, you've gotten bored already of my example of Santa Claus at Christmas. Uh, who else is here? I, I, won't, I won't pick on James again. Let's say Victor. Victor putting on a pillow underneath the red suit, putting on a beard and a red hat, walking down the steps with a bag over his shoulder at, uh, at Christmas morning. Uh, and the kids see the same thing that the adults in the room see, but uh, they believe that that's actually Santa Claus. So I don't know if, if, you know, at a certain point they don't believe and they get seven or eight or nine, uh, but when they're young enough, uh, and the adults in the room see the same thing, but having known that that's a victor, uh, they don't adhere to that. They don't believe that. So it's kind of like the, at, at, at this stage of our development, our mind that's looking at the eye, the eye is appearing within the mental consciousness, the sense of the eye. And the, our mind is like those children believing in that. Yeah, there is an eye. Therefore, I can get angry. I should get angry. I should defeat the enemy. I should, you know, get, you know, steal or do, you know, engage in negative activities. So in a sense, there are two objects of negation here. Who's the older student? Shanka, I'll, I'll ask Shanka again. Shanka, what are the two objects of negation here? You know? Um, the, would you, okay, so would you repeat what, what I kind of spaced out for a moment. Okay, I'm, okay, just, no, okay, okay. Your, your roof was leaking or something. So one, I said that the, the the sense of this I, the ego, me, that's appearing to the mind, not in this, again, not in the sense of a visual appearance, but this, this, this prominence, you know, just like to say that you can say that the body seems to be appearing to me. It's not that I'm looking at the body, but I have the sense of the solidity of the body, right? So there's a sense of the existence of this I to the mind. That I is an object of negation. It is an object to be refuted that although it seems to be appear, it, it appears, maybe uses, I don't want to leave off the word seems to because it does appear when you actually get a subtle mind and you can actually uh, sense it. It appears, but it doesn't exist the way that it appears. That, that the object that you imagine it to be in an ignorant state doesn't exist. That's called, that object that you're imagining is called the object of negation. Um, when you negate that, it doesn't mean the I immediately never appears to you again. It means that your uh, the sense of it being like it appears has been refuted that, you know, like you, 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 when she turned her head and saw her reflection in the, in the, the door of the hotel uh, window glass, it's not as though that there was no longer an appearance there, but it, she no longer uh, thought that that was another person. So that's one object of negation. The other object of negation or refutation is the consciousness that believes that that has to be refuted, not in the sense of saying that that consciousness doesn't exist, 
but negated or refuted in the sense of ceasing it. That's an ultimate object of negation. Have you heard that before, Shanga? No, I actually have not. Okay. I mean, that's very, yeah, I mean. So it's, it's different in the sense of, the, the sense of the I, until you reach Buddhahood, it will still reappear when you're not in meditative equipoise on emptiness. There will always be that sense of I, and like we talked about the illusion-like meditation on emptiness before. Do you remember that? When we talked about illusion-like meditation, once you have the space-like meditation on emptiness, you will rise from that and things appear again, but you sort of have the sense that there are illusions. You kind of chuckle to yourself. Oh, God, that eye, this tenacious bugger is appearing there again. You know, you know it doesn't exist, but it still appears. So that's that eye, which is called the object of negation of logic. You prove that it doesn't exist. Uh, it still appears when you're not in meditative equipoise. But the other object of negation, the, the consciousness grasping to that, that can be eliminated even before you're enlightened. That ignorance can be ceased, what we call true cessation, so that it, it doesn't come back again. That's called the object of negation of practice, of, of, of meditation, you might say. So here we're mainly talking about the, these two objects to be negated. One is negated in the sense that you prove that it doesn't exist the way it appears, the sense of I. And the other is being negated in the sense or refuted in the sense that uh, it is erroneously, ignorantly grasping to something that doesn't exist, and you want to prove to the mind, uh, as a base, uh, on the basis of recognizing that this object it's grasping to doesn't exist, this belief in it, this assent to it, this ignorant grasping to it will begin to dissipate. Uh, you no longer, say for instance, that you, uh, example the Dalai Lama gives sometimes, you know, you think that something is stolen from your house and you try to figure out who's stealing it. And you think it's the maid or the butler or your son or your daughter or the, the, the plumber or, you know, someone or a thief. You go through all of these and you, you prove that none of them uh, have stolen. Then you recognize that there was, ne that there was never any silverware stolen. So here, here is a similar kind of thing. You recognize, uh, you prove that this does not exist the way it appears, the I. And as a result of that, the belief in that begins to diminish. Uh, you no longer are pointing fingers at different people. Oh, you're the thief, you're the thief, and so forth. So th th this little exercise that we did, yeah, Shanka. Alex has a question. Shall I read it to, or you maybe- Oh yeah, I didn't see that Alex had had a question. Yeah, please, yeah, read it. Are the mind and the body actually real and so not objects of negation, unlike the I? Ah, okay, good question. So what do you think, Alex? Can you speak or you, you, you were, you just don't have enough bandwidth? Yeah, thank you. Um... Yeah, I can, I guess. Um, uh, well, it seems like the mind and the body may be real and we're not negating them exactly, but we're negating this third thing, which is in a sense, an illusion. And that is the eye. Uh, and I'm wondering how is the eye then, does it mean we, we're still left with mind and body even after negation, um, just not sure how that will work. Okay, so uh, good question. Generally in the Hinayana system, you know, the, the lower part of Buddhist 
uh, philosophy, or nowadays, nowadays exemplified by the Theravada we find in Thailand and Sri Lanka and different places like that, Burma. Generally, what is being negated is not the body and mind, but the self. But even their sense of the self that they uh, talk about in their uh, commentaries and in their scriptures uh, is not the subtle most sense of the self that's appearing here. It's a little, little grosser version of that. So that, that's renowned in the Hinayana that uh, we don't talk about the emptiness of the body or the emptiness of the mind. We just talk about the selflessness of the eye, the lack of an eye. Whereas in the Heart Sutra, Alex, have you heard, have you ever read the Heart Sutra or heard of it? I have heard of it. I have not read it. Okay, so that it might be a nice thing. Uh, it's very short. Thank you three, four, five minutes to read. So in that, there is a, uh, besides the fact the Buddha is sitting there in meditative equipoise, one of his disciples is Shariputra, who was foremost of the Hinayana disciples in wisdom. He was known as the, the guy who had the best understanding of wisdom that the Buddha praised, foremost in wisdom of my disciples, the Buddha said. And he's asking, Avalokiteshvara, which is, although we, we in, in Mahayana Buddhism, we talk about Avalokiteshvara as a uh, meditational deity, you know, thousand-armed Chenrezig, thousand-armed Avalokiteshvara. Chenrezi is a Tibetan word. Avalokiteshvara is the same in Sanskrit. Uh, Avalokiteshvara was the name of one of the Buddha's disciples, Bodhisattva disciples, not, not pr practicing the Hinayana path, but on the basis of renunciation, he developed bodhicitta in the past. Remember when we talk about the three principles? So he was a bodhisattva and he was considered to be a very high bodhisattva who'd realized emptiness and so forth. So Shariputra is asking uh, sort of the, at the beginning of the Har Sutra, how did the bodhisattvas practice their perfection of wisdom? Because he, Implication is, I, Shariputra, know how the Hinayana practitioners practice wisdom. They meditate on the, on the selflessness of the I. Then Avalokiteshvara replied, uh, the Bodhisattvas meditate on the emptiness of the aggregates also. The five aggregates also. In other words, we talk about the, the five aggregates are the basis for imputing the person, right? The basis for recognizing a person. From the Hinayana point of view, the self that we imagine within those five aggregates doesn't exist, but aligned with, with your question, they believe that the aggregates themselves, the body exists, the consciousness exists, the way that it appears, feelings exist, discriminations exist, compositional factors exist. So Avalokiteshvara said, the bodhisattvas meditate, I'll add some extra words. They not only meditate on the emptiness of the I, they me also meditate on the emptiness of the five aggregates. So that although your body and mind, after, after refuting the I, you might think, well, at least the body and mind are here. They, they, they meditate in the same way. The body, where is the body? Where can you find the body? Is it the, in the head, in the arms, you know, uh, and so forth. When you analyze in a certain way, in a correct way, you can recognize that the body, what we call body is just a name we impute to a collection of parts. And so, it is, although the body appears to our eyes or even our tactile sensation, and you, you, you're next to someone on the, on the tram or the bus and you, you can feel them with your, your uh, tactile consciousness, right? You hear them uh, or you hear the body. You, hear, you, hear, maybe you can hear the body as someone gets smacked. <laughs> uh, I won't talk about tasting or smelling the body, but 
uh, there's a sense that there is a findable, inherently existing, real existing body out there. Mahayana Buddhism goes beyond simply refuting the self of the person to refuting the, ex the inherent existence or the true existence of all phenomena. So although the body appears, it, it is empty or void or devoid of existing the way that it appears as findable. Somehow uh, there's something there that's existing from its own side that if you search, you can find what is the body. So that may not be, that may be a little too complicated or maybe, maybe uh, Alex uh, answer, answered your question, but the short answer is that uh, once you realize the emptiness of the I or the selflessness of the I, you, you refute it, you have to go on and refute the existence of the body the way that it appears and refute the, the, the way that the mind appears as somehow a real findable thing. And in the end, when you're meditating on emptiness, it's not simply that the I has been refuted and you see its vacuity, but you recognize that all phenomena, the way that they appear as existing from their own side is, 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 has been negated. You recognize that they do not exist that way. Did that help a little, Alex? Yes, thank you. Okay. Mr. Shankar. Um, I think James had his hand up a few times. And I... Oh, I'm sorry. James, I did I miss? James Butler, do you have a question? No, I, I, I don't. Maybe I'm fidgeting, you know. Okay. okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. So... Uh, last Sunday, I mentioned that in this, uh, as we're talking about the three principles of the path, renunciation, bodhicitta, <coughs> we've gotten to the point of now talking about the third principle of the path, the wisdom that realizes emptiness. And I said that we can under, we, we've been told that without this wisdom, we can't even achieve liberation from samsara. We can't achieve the Hinayana goal of our hardship, even though we have renunciation. Without this wisdom of emptiness, we cannot achieve enlightenment, the goal of the bodhisattva path, even though we have bodhicitta, we work for sentient beings frantically, you know, selflessly. Uh, we can't achieve that goal without this wisdom. We talked about um, it is being the uh, the, 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 say the, the ignorance that grasps to phenomena, to persons and phenomena as inherently existent is the cause of the rising of all of our delusions. The cause of, you know, our anger, our attachment, our other kinds of ignorance. It is itself a kind of ignorance. It is the, the cause of jealousy and pride, depression, low self-esteem, the whole panoply of uh, possible, un, you, know, you know, delusive states, uh, unpeaceful states, what we call klesha, klesha or delusions or afflictions are th those things that are, when present in our mind, uh, cause the the calmness of our mind to go away, the clarity to go away. And uh, in their, in, when they are present in our mind, they create negative karma. We talk about the cause of suffering, the second noble truth, uh, twofold, karma and klesha. First of all, karma that's been created in the past is the immediate cause of suffering. It's, its cause always is klesha, the delusions in our mind that when acted upon, uh, create negative karma that leads to suffering. So if we want to get out of cyclic existence, if we want to achieve um, enlightenment, we have to have the wisdom that cuts off the root of all of these delusions. That root is the, uh, the ignorance that grasps 
to inherent existence. So we talked about that before. Now what we're trying to say, we're trying to understand is how do you go about developing that wisdom? You know, you can talk about it, say, get an idea, say, oh yeah, it doesn't exist, but that's just on the just on the level of belief. What we want to do is go to the level of where we can actually realize that the I that appears to us, and subsequently the body and mind and trees and computers and cars and other people and so forth, all of them are devoid of the of a certain way that they're appearing. They're not devoid, let's say a tree is not, my trees outside my window are not devoid of green. They are green, but they're devoid of being inherently green. We're, we're not, we're not uh, refuting that Shanka's body that we see on our Zoom class here uh, doesn't exist conventionally. It does appear, but the way that it appears is uh, as though it, it exists inherently and really. To a Buddhist mind, to an omniscient mind, there is nothing that appears from its own side as being inherently existent. He sees things or she, she sees things as they actually exist. The Buddha does know how things appear to us. You know, it's not as though the Buddha is just sitting there and every everyone around is saying, you know, the, the Buddha doesn't see us or doesn't know what we're what we're thinking. He sees us the way that we imagine ourselves by knowing our minds with the clairvoyance of omniscience. So if, if, if you ask the Buddha, does this, does this inherently exist? The Buddha will know what you're talking about because he knows our minds, what we're thinking, you know, what we're, what we're seeing, what we're hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and so forth. So the program here we're talking about is how do we go about proving, as a starting point, the non-existence of the I, the inherently existent I, and we have to we have to remember we're not talking about we're not refuting I in general. Say for instance, Ida. Ida, I'll point to Ida. Okay, you don't you don't know I'm pointing at you. There you are there, your blue blue uh, blouse or shirt or whatever sweater. So Ida uh, is a person. From the point of view of Mahayana Buddha Buddhism. Ida does exist conventionally. So we're not refuting the Ida that exists conventionally. How does Ida exist conventionally? Ida uh, is just a name that we give to the collection of her aggregates, her five aggregates here in the desire realm. It seems like that's not enough seems like there must be something that's really Ida, not just a name giving to that, that seems unsatisfying. Ida is just the name given to her collection of five aggregates. Uh, if we say, where is Ida? Uh, would I be correct to say that Ida is in New Mexico, Ida? Uh, Ida is in uh, Santa Fe. Okay, you get a point. Say, I, you know, where is Ida? Ida is there in Santa Fe. Ida is at so and so address. You go to that house and say, well, where's Ida? Ida's inside the house. You go inside the house. She, she's not, you know, she's in the, I can't see what that is, the library or the altar room. Ida's in there. Come in, you look around like you're completely oblivious. Maybe there's someone else there, the dog or the children or someone else. And you say, who's Ida? And you point to Ida. That's, legitimately said in Buddhism from the Mahayana point of view, from the correct view, you can say Ida is there. You can point to Ida. But when you try to investigate what's the what where is Ida more than that? You know, is it her heart? Is it her uh, face? Is Ida her mind? 
is either her wisdom, her compassion. You might think uh, there's something there that you can point to that's the essence of Ida. There's nothing. Ida is just the attribution, the name, the imputation, <laughs> if you will, that sounds too technical, the name, you know, uh, that's attributed to her body and mind. That's the only Ida that you can find. And it is coming from our side. We're imputing it. There's nothing from Ida's side, which is Ida-ness. <laughs> Ida nature coming from us inherently existing there as Ida. At a certain point in her life, she might have had a nickname. Did you have a nickname when you were a kid? Do your parents call you? But what do they call you? Squirrel. Squirrel. Okay, yeah, squirrel. So one time, that was squirrel. Now maybe you know she wouldn't say that in a business meeting. Someone she wouldn't want people to call her squirrel or something like that. But. Uh, that was also just a name attributed to those body, uh, the body and mind, the five aggregates at one time. That legitimately exists. But the Ida that does not exist is the her sense of her own self and our sense of something like, you know, so we make that we make that kind of attribution. Because we sense an I-ness of ourself, we attribute to others that there must be something findable within them, you know, a real Ida there somewhere. That's the one that's being refuted here, not the conventionally existent Ida, okay? So how do we go about disproving this inherently existent Ida? First of all, we have to, recognize the object to be negated because we don't want to go too far we don't in our negation we we don't want to come to the conclusion that oh i don't exist at all therefore it doesn't matter what i do i can kill myself because i don't exist you know i i can commit negative actions because uh i don't exist we don't want to go we don't want to uh, over refute. We don't want to refute the conventional I. We want to refute just this inherently existent I. So in order to do that, we have to recognize it, to delineate, to, to see it exactly what it is, how it appears. And that's what we were doing in our little meditation at the beginning. It's, the, it's what's called the first essential point. Now, there are various logical ways to establish selflessness or emptiness. One of the easiest to understand at first is really enshrined in the Lan Rim, the stages of the path, the Lan Rim literature, um, what's called the four essential points. Okay. Do you know what those are? Have you heard that before? Anyone has not heard of that before? James, have you heard of the four essential points? Okay, you didn't know, you didn't go like that before. You're just sitting there. Yeah. Nancy, have you heard of the four essential points? Not that I know of. If I've heard it, it hasn't been specifically called the four essential points. Okay. Alexis, have you heard of the four essential points? If I did, it went through one ear out the other. <laughs> so I don't know. Oh, okay. So now this time, make it make a determination to keep it inside, <laughs> keep it inside your 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 mind and your brain, your brain, but especially your mind. So first essential point is identifying that which is to be negated, the object of negation, or we can say the object of refutation. So that's in that is to be done meditatively. In a sense, you can kind of theoretically talk about it. It's an I that seems to be existing from its own side, but you have to recognize that in practice. You have to sit down, watch the mind when it's very, very quiet. The reason it has to be quiet is when, when there's so many other thoughts going on and your attention is going here and there, you can't notice the, the way that the I is appearing, the subtle way that it's appearing. 
as though it's existing from its own side. So in that quiet state of mind, at first, uh, it's skillful to instigate the sense of I by remembering sometime you were falsely accused, you know, you are a thief or something like that. Um, and then you can start to note, you, then you let go of ruminating about that. You just watch the way that the eye seems to be appearing. Another way that you can identify the eye uh, is one of the classic ways is that you go to a very fearful place, a fearsome place, would I say, uh, like a, a, a charnel ground. Do you know what a, Charlene, do you know what a, char, a charnel ground is? Susie already said she didn't know what a charnel ground is. Shanka, you, you explain, what is a charnel ground? Uh, well, in India, they, uh, they burn the bodies, right? Once you die. Well, that's not a charnel, that's not the charnel ground. Charnel well, ground is where the skeleton, the bones and stuff are, right? Uh, charnel ground is, a, is like, where you bring the bodies, you deposit them on a, in a field and you just let them rot and decompose. Oh, okay. Right? Tibetan, you know, what is our, the uh, peoples of the book, the Abrahamic religions usually bury bodies, right? That's one way, that's called earth burial. Tibetans have a kind of sky burial. Have you heard of that? You take the body up to the hill and these professional people cut apart and uh, cut, you know, uh, they cut the top of the skull off and they put the brain with some barley uh, in, and they let the uh, vultures eat the body. That's called sky burial. Uh, the Hindus have the fire burial that's very pr prominent and so forth. Uh, so charnel grounds, I think charnel grounds existed also in Europe and so forth in the past areas where you just throw the body and uh, it might be in a ravine, it might be in a field. Uh, there were places you wouldn't want to go because they stank. Uh, you saw rotting bodies. There were flies and vultures and so forth around. Uh, but in particular, there was a sense that they were inhabited by spirits, like our cemetery, like bad, you know, fearful cemeteries. So there's a tradition in Buddhism of going to these places uh, especially at night when there's no moon. Why? More frightful, more frightening. What happens when, when you're frightened like that? Ooh, you know, the, the leaves, you know, you get goosebumps, you think there's something there. And the, the appearance of the eye manifests more strongly, kind of like when you've been accused, right? But here, so there is a tradition, uh, maybe you've heard of this practice called Ch. Have you heard, anyone heard of her, Ch? Shanka has heard five times or four times, I couldn't show how many fingers he said. Nadine, have you heard of Ch? C-H-O-D, you don't say it, Chad. It's the, the, the final D in Tibetan is, makes it a shortened vowel, so Ch. Uh, Actually, Dharma is pronounced ch, but it, it, its final uh, its final consonant is an s, so it, it doesn't make it cut off as quickly. So ch is kind of like just cut. It, ch means to cut or to slaughter. So what it means is a practice when you go to the charnel ground, or let's say the cemetery, or let's say East Harlem or something like that, someplace that's frightening to you, someplace in your neighborhood, and you, you allow the sense of fear to arise. And in so doing, you try to recognize the object of negation. And as a result of that, you're in a better position to slay it, to cut it off, to, to realize its non-existence. You following? Okay. So first essential point in logically establishing selflessness or emptiness is in this system is called the recognition of the object of negation. The different ways you can do it. You can augment it by 
you know, going to a particular place, or you can just, you could augment it by thinking of something that's, uh, you've been falsely accused, for instance, or you can just simply watch the mind in deep meditation until you recognize that object mm -hmm. negation, how it appears, its attributes and so forth. So the second, there's, let, me, let me enumerate the other three points. So the four essential points, let me use four things. Recognizing the object of negation, then what's called establishing the pervasion, pervasion, not perversion, establishing the pervasion. Uh, and then the pervasion is going to be, uh, for instance, in this case, if something exists, if two things exist, let's say, they either have to be the same or they have to be different. Would you, would you agree with that? Matthew, what do you think? Let's say, uh, what's, what, what languages do you know? Do you know French or Spanish? Do you know Spanish? Uh, no, I only only English. Okay, so uh, I don't know. How do you say uh, anyone else? How do, how do you say dog in Spanish? So it's uh, perro. Yes, perro. Perro. Okay, good. That was a nice pronunciation. Perro. Perro. Or Tibetan key. Someone say something. France. French. How do you say dog in French? It's a chan, chan. Chan. So yes. anyway, the different, different languages have different words. So uh, if you say there are two things, uh, perro and dog, are they the same or different? Uh, as a question to you guys. Susie, are perro and dog the same or different? The same meaning, but different words. Yeah, yeah, good, good point, good, precise point. They're, they're different names, but they have the same meaning. So let's just talk about meaning here. Uh, if, if perro and dog exist, if they both exist, they either have to be the same, and we're talking about meaning here, they either have to be the same meaning or different meanings. Say, for instance, maybe we don't know Spanish, we think perro might mean an ox or might mean tree or might mean, you know, something else. So we have to investigate. But if two things exist, they either have to be the same or different. That's called the pervasion. Do you know what pervasion means? Victor, do you know what the word pervasion means? No, I don't. Okay, good. Larry, do you know? Larry, Larry Heath, you can't get to, oh yeah, you're just shaking your head. You're so far away, I can't see if you're shaking your head or not. So pervasion kind of means necessity. Um, well, when we say uh, flowers pervaded the promenade, you know, there are flowers everywhere, right? They cover everything. Pervasion means to cover. So uh, here, the pervasion means, the word pervasion in this sense, logical sense means that if two things uh, exist, there is a necessity or a pervasion that they are either the same or different. Could there be some third possibility if two things exist? Either they're this, the identical, you're talking about one thing, I think two names or something, or you're talking about two things. Is there any other alternative? Nancy, what do you think? I'm not sure. It's saying different or indifferent. I don't know. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> different. Yeah, I'm not sure what you mean. If two things are either identical or non-identical, if two things exist, is there another possibility? There's a necessity. Nadine is kind of saying, yeah, she's, she's, I think she's saying that there's no other possibility. They either have to be the same or different. 
Let me ask you this. If something exists, and I'm, this will be more familiar to those of you who studied uh, philosophy before in Buddhism or tenets, if, if something exists, it either has to be permanent or impermanent. What do you think? I'm going to ask someone whose face I can't see here. Annie Nash, Nash Chime. You want to chime in? Annie, if two things, if, if something exists, does it have to be permanent or impermanent or is there some other possibility? Maybe Annie is off vacuuming the floor. I don't know, let's see. A Anna Coglin. You there? I think people are off making tea. The, the, the class has been too boring. Okay, so I'll ask someone who's- No, 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 I'm here. Oh, you're here. I couldn't, okay. get, I couldn't get unmuted quickly enough. Oh, okay. Um, I think that, well, everything, if it exists, everything is impermanent. Oh, you think everything is impermanent. So Every, the, everything is subject to time and to change. Okay, uh, that's an interesting position. So that's, that's kind of like the position of some uh, early Buddhist schools. When we talk about the four seals, the, you know, S-E-A-L, not, not the animal <laughs> seals. <laughs> uh, the four seals that that uh, prove that something is a Buddhist doctrine. Usually we say all compounded phenomena are impermanent, all contaminated phenomena are suffering, all phenomena are empty and selfless. Those are called the four seals. And sometimes in the early Theravada, there were some people that said all phenomena are impermanent. So going along with uh, Anna's, maybe Anna in the time of Buddha, maybe you were one of the Theravada Buddhists that believed everything was impermanent. So generally uh, other Theravadas and Mahayana say that not all phenomena are impermanent. There are things that are permanent, such as uh, uncompounded space. That means the lack of obstructing contact. You might say, that if you move somewhere else, let's say the, the, the uncompounded space right here, is it changing moment by moment? No, there's still the lack of obstructing contact. It doesn't change. Also cessations are said to be permanent, true cessations. And the, here's some technical language for you that if you're a beginner, you might not understand what that means. When you cease the the delusions, the afflictions, the klesha from the root so that they will never come back again, that state of cessation doesn't change. It's not as though the delusion sort of appears and that's, that's kind, of, kind of how it is right now. Our delusions, maybe we get angry sometime and then it di disappears as an imprint in our mind and like vacillate in a little bit. Maybe sometime it's not there for a long time then that is very big. When you have a cessation of a delusion, a klesha, like anger or attachment or something, or ignorance, you have ceased it so that it will never return. So that state of cessation is permanent. It doesn't change moment by moment. Also emptiness itself, the state of emptiness, the fact that phenomena are empty of inherent existence that is permanent. It doesn't change moment by moment. Okay. Yeah, I, Ida. Uh, what about when an object ceases to exist? It, uh, its emptiness also ceases to exist, correct? Yes. So that is what's, what Jeffrey Hopkins, I think Jeffrey Hopkins called, uh, uh, what are we, a temporal uh, permanent. That is, say for instance, if we talk about your mind stream, Ida's mind stream, your mind stream has existed since beginningless time. You can't see my hand way pointing off to the infinite past, to the present, it's existing now. 
it will exist in the future. Uh, even when you become Buddha, enlightened, your mind stream will still exist, right? It's a continuum. Uh, is existed in the past, existing now, exists in the future. What about uh, the emptiness of your mind stream? Your mind stream uh, of the past was empty of inherent existence, the immediate past, the present, the immediate future, the distant future, always empty of inherent existence. But the emptiness of Ida's mind stream, that means the, the person that we call Ida that was born some years ago and will inevitably die sometime, that period of time that we call Ida, uh, the emptiness of Ida will go out of existence when Ida passes away. Or the classic example, like a clay, a clay pot. The, the emptiness of the clay pot, of one particular clay pot, uh, doesn't exist before that clay pot is created. Did you know that? There's no empty, you can't say that the emptiness of the clay pot, emptiness exists, but not the emptiness of that clay pot didn't exist before the clay pot was made. When the clay pot is broken and is no longer recognized as a clay pot, it might be that it's still recognizable to you. Oh, that's my clay pot in pieces on the floor. But when, when, when it's no longer recognized as a clay pot, the emptiness of that clay pot no longer exists. So that's called a, a, a temporary permanent phenomena. The emptiness is permanent, but it only exists for a certain, you know, a certain period of time. So here, the reason I'm saying this is there's a pervasion, a necessity that if something exists, it either has to be permanent or impermanent, or I should say impermanent first, maybe because that's the most, to us, that seems to be the most prominent case. Although there are more permanent things than impermanent things. Would you agree, Shanka? There are more permanent things, more permanent phenomena than impermanent phenomena? To more permanent phenomena than impermanent phenomena. Yeah. Um, to us, that's a, that's how it appears. Yes, is that what you mean? No, in, in reality, to us, it seems like there's more impermanent things. You know, I give some some examples like true cessations and emptiness and so forth. You might say, oh, those are ex rare examples. Everything I see is impermanent. Like like uh, who who had said that? Anna had said, yeah, everything's impermanent. Actually, there are more permanent things than impermanent things, but I'll leave that. That's, for that's you to think, I'll leave I'll that, that for you to think about. Okay, why that's the case. Anyway, so there's a pervasion. If something exists, it has to be permanent or impermanent. Necessity. There's no third alternative. So that's that's example. Like when I said before, if the if the self exists, it either has to be. Well, I said, if two things exist, they either have to be the same or different. That's a pervasion or a necessity. Let me, let me, let me try on the permanent and permanent first. <clears throat> so let's say this, <clears throat> the son of a barren woman. Susie, do you, have you ever heard of that before? <clears throat> the son of a barren woman. What does a barren woman mean? I'm confused because a barren woman I thought was somebody who couldn't give birth. So the son of a barren woman, I don't understand. <laughs> well, you do understand that. Let's say, imagine, you know, that uh, there is oh, a, a barren woman and you have an imagination in, in your, your wake up and you think, oh, maybe, maybe it is Mabel. Mabel is a, a barren woman. And you think, oh, maybe Mabel's son broke my window. Well, Mabel's son doesn't exist, right? Mabel's, the, the, the son of a barren woman is one of the classic examples in the Buddha. You know, it must have been it's sort of an interesting time thing at the time of the Buddha and in the Vedic period, they talk about this. It's an, you know, you have an imagination of something that doesn't exist. You know, you know Mabel's son broke my window or, you know, uh, you know, son of a barren woman. Another example of something that doesn't exist are the horns of a rabbit. 
right? Although in New Mexico, you have the postcards of the macalope, no, no, jackalope, right? With a little rabbit with horns on the head. So the, the horns of a rabbit, the son of a barren woman, let's take the son of a barren woman. So if a son of a barren woman existed, it would either have to be permanent or impermanent, right? Because if, ex if something exists, it has to be permanent in, in, or impermanent. So you can investigate whether the son of a, of a barren woman is, uh, you know, it's, it's something that you're imagining because it, you, you, you can't point to the son of a, a barren woman outside or the horns of a rabbit. If the horns of a rabbit existed, they would have to be permanent or impermanent. There's a pervasion, there's a necessity. So you can investigate that way. So I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna mention this now applied to the, uh, the pervasion that's, that's used in establishing emptiness. One of the pervasions. If the self exists the way that it appears, it either has to be identical to the aggregates or different than the aggregates. Remember I said, if two things existed, they either had to be the same or different. Do you remember that, James? Do you remember that? If two things exist, they have to be the same or different. So you uh, Yes, I, I do remember that, yes. Okay, good, thank you. <laughs> so, um, who haven't I called? I haven't called on Larry or Amanda. So, what we do is, first of all, we try to recognize, the first point was recognizing the object of negation, the sense of the I. So then, you know that the I is somehow related with the aggregates. You take these two things to compare. The I, the sense of I, the inherently existent I, not the conventional I, not the conventional Ida, the conventional James, whatever, but the inherently existent I and the aggregates that are, that are associated with that person. Ag Ida's aggregates, James' aggregates, whatever. You compare those. Are they the same or different? What do you think? Amanda, are your aggregates and your I, the inherent, the sense of the inherently existent I, are they the same or different? Um, they're neither because there's no inherently existing I. Well, this is what you're investigating. You're just saying that in the in the in the case of you, know, you say a belief that there's no inherently existent I. We're trying to prove that there's no inherently existent I. There's an appearance of an I, inherently existent I, within your consciousness, a, let's say sense of the inherently existent I. So you investigate. If that I existed the way that it appeared, it would either have to be the same of the same as the aggregates or different than the aggregates. Coming out of left field, it's, you say, why do they say that? I gave the example of say, if something exists, it either has to be permanent or impermanent, remember? Here we're talking, we're, we're giving another alternative, uh, another uh, uh, set. There could, if two things exist, they either have to be the same, or let's say identical, or they have to be different. Remember we talked about dog and perro, right? Our dog, are dog and perro the same, identical, or are they different? Well, as, as Susie said, uh, they're not the same name, but they have the same, they're identical in meaning, even though they're different names, right? So now we're, we're leaving those just as exem examples to, to get our mind in the right framework. We, we use this particular pervasion that if two things exist, they either have to be identical or different in applying to the I. You, you, you have recognized the I as the first essential point. 
And now you say, if that I existed the way that it appears, it would either have to be identical to the aggregates or different than the aggregates. Do you understand the words at least? Nancy, do you? Yeah. Larry, what do you think? Are you following this? Oh, you have to get, oh, you have to go all the way there. Now you're getting, because that's an interesting point. You want to, what do you think? I had to unmute it. Uh, the uh, um, inherently existent I, if it existed, it would be permanent. It would seem to me. And the, um, the aggregates are impermanent. Okay. Then you would and say, the then you would say the inherently existent I uh, is different than the aggregates, right? It would be different from the aggregates, yes. Now you could you you'd make that you'd make that choice. You'd say it's it's different than the aggregates. Okay, so the 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 secret sauce here that you have to use is when you talk about uh, the inherent the sense of an inherently existent I. If the I were different than the aggregates it would have to be inherently different than the aggregates. And if it was the same as the aggregates, the so-called inherently existent I we're trying to investigate, it would have to be inherently the same as the aggregates. I remember when Keshi, Keshi Zopa was teaching us about emptiness at Deer Park for many summers, uh, this is sort of, uh, I, I'm using this, sir. He didn't say secret sauce. This is what you have to, this is sort of the uh, understanding that you have to have. If something is inherently exist, if, if, if it were inherently existent, because as Larry pointed out, there is nothing that's inherently existent, but if it were inherently existent, it would either have to be inherently one with the aggregates or inherently different than the aggregates. That's called establishing the pervasion, the second essential point. First essential point, recognizing the object to be negated. Second essential point is establishing the pervasion. If this thing that you recognized, the first essential point, the, in, the sense of an inherently existent self, if that existed, it would have to be inherently one with the aggregates or inherently different than the aggregates. That's called the pervasion. Can't be anything else. Then the third and fourth points are showing that it is not inherently one with the aggregates. It's not, not it's not, it, you are not, the uh, I is not inherently one with the aggregates and it is not inherently different than the aggregates. Okay, so we'll, we'll in our next class, we'll try to exa examine those last two points because that's, uh, although, the most difficult, what do you suppose the most difficult point of these four essential points is? Does anyone have an opinion? Just having heard, the first one is identifying the object of negation, establishing the pervasion, uh, and then proving that it is not either of those things. So that if it's not inherently one with the aggregates, it's not inherently different than the aggregates, therefore it doesn't exist. That would be the final conclusion. Which of those, four points do you think is most difficult to execute, let's say, realize? Nadine, what do you think? I think the first one, because uh, they always say you should spend so much time on this one. <laughs> yeah, that's a, good, that's a good reason. You've heard uh, great meditators say that that's the most difficult. Yeah, it, one, one great meditator said that uh, even if you spend a year or two years meditating to recognize the object of negation, it might take that long, really see so clearly, clearly how it seems to appear that the second, third, and fourth points could be established in an afternoon. You know, you could prove emptiness. So the most important the most difficult to establish is the first, recognizing the object of negation. That's what we were trying to do at our, our motivation at the beginning. Remember I said, you know, clear your mind, first of all. Uh, we were meditating on the clear light nature of the mind so that you, the, 
the mind becomes, uh, you can recognize any kind of uh, other thoughts in it very clearly. So you just start from there, then try to instigate the eye, try to see how it's appearing. And even when the instigation is gone, see if you can hold on to the continuity of how that eye is appearing. It appears to be existing from its own side without being labeled, without the need to be labeled, it's just there. It's truly, it seems to be truly existent, inherently existent. And then applying the, the pervasion, uh, relatively easy to understand. If two things exist, they either have to be the same or different. And adding the special sauce here for the, that the I, if the inherently, inherently existing I existed, if it were to exist, it would have to be inherently identical to the aggregates or, I, or inherently different from the aggregates. Inherently here means from the completely, it would have to be completely the same or completely different. Larry, you have a thought? I've been trying to ask this from the very beginning, which is to clear up uh, uh, one quick thing in my mind. Are we talking about uh, two eyes, uh, uh, a conventional eye that serves as the subject to investigate the, the uh, inherently existent eye, which is the one that, that we're concerned with? I've, are yeah. the two eyes that are involved here? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I think we, 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 we addressed this a little bit before, but maybe not that exact point. When we talked about Ida, Ida does exist conventionally. Uh, Buddhism, when we talk about selflessness or the lack of a self of persons, it doesn't mean that Larry doesn't exist. Larry conventionally exists. There is a conventionally existent Larry but it's much different than what we usually think of. Larry exists merely as the name attributed to your body and mind complex, your five aggregates. There and this is, is the eye that's going to be investigating. This is no, the subject. No, no, that's the, that's the well, I, 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 I'm not sure I heard all your sentence. That's the investigator. That's, you know, actually it's the, remember there are two kinds of agent here who, who are meditating. Larry is meditating. Larry could be called the agent or the meditator, but what is the instrument that Larry is using to meditate is Larry's mind. That's kind of like the, the example I've given in the other class also, uh, when uh, a lumberjack or a lumberjane, can I say that? Now I guess you have to say, you don't say actresses anymore. You say both male and females are actors, right? Uh, so you could say, I mean, Lumberjack already has sort of masculine, you know, sounds like a, a man, although there may be some women named Jack. So whether the, 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 the person who's cutting the tree is the agent of cutting, right? The person who's doing is the actor of cutting, right? right. But isn't the ax also the agent? Isn't that doing the cutting? Yes, uh, it is. Yeah. So there are two kinds of agent or actor here. There's the person and there's the instrument that the person is wielding. So although Larry is meditating, the instrument that, that uh, Larry is using to meditate is the mind. You might say that, oh, my body, because my body is like this. That's not doing the meditating. That's just a cooperative condition. The agent of Larry that's doing the meditation is his mind. So you, know, you could say, you want to say the actor or the agent is Larry, that's okay, but that's the conventionally existent Larry. Why is Larry meditating? Because his mind is meditating, concentrating. So it's investigating the sense of an inherently existent I in our meditation on emptiness here. If that I that sensed to exist, that's appearing, if it were to exist the way that it appears as inherently existent, 
it would have to be inherently the same as the aggregates. That would means it would have to be identical to the aggregates. Or it would have to be inherently different than the aggregates, have no connection with the aggregates whatsoever. Even a cursory investigation, you can you can almost get the sense it can't be inherently the same of the aggregates because there are five aggregates. There's only one I. It can't be inherently different than the aggregates because then if someone were to stick a needle in your arm, you wouldn't say, oh, I've been, or, or if a bee were to sting you, you wouldn't say, I've been stung. You know, there is, a, there is some relationship between the aggregates and the I if the I were inherently different than the aggregates, there would be no sense that this is me. And if it was inherently the same as the aggregates, because there are five aggregates, five parts, there would have to be a different aggregate, there would have to be a different I for each of the aggregates. There would have to be five I's. Or conversely, as there's one I, there would have to be just one aggregate. Anyway, we'll talk that that part the, that that analysis we'll talk about next time. I've thrown a lot at you today. I hope you you don't haven't gotten indigestion, dharma indigestion. Um, anyone have a question that you'd like to ask before we finish up? Susie. Uh, super quick, two things. Next time, can we start with the four essential points? Because they're starting to go in, but not clear enough to write down. Right. And <laughs> um, so if, if, if we could just, quick, if not, that's fine. And secondly, I just want to say, I feel a bit of a turd because of course a barren woman could of course be a mother. And I just want to say that I know that that's not the point, but it makes me, it just made me feel really uncomfortable. Right, right, so a, a woman of course, who, is, who has had children can become barren, right? That's what you're saying. Oh, well, no, but you can you can be a mother just as much as a mother and adopt or anything else. I just want to say that, but I know that that's not the point that you're trying to make. Well, here here the, the implication is the thought that uh, a woman who is cannot have children, you know, you, you can still have the misconception that she has a child, you know. Uh, Say for instance, the misconception that the, the the reflection in the in the door of the hotel was actually another woman. It does appear there might be a conception that of a woman who cannot have children. You might think, oh, doesn't she have a child? Didn't he do this or that? You know, there's a vague memory or something. But that is that's one of the classic examples that's used to refer to something uh, for you know conceptual reasons you believe to exist, but but if you think about it, you could realize doesn't exist. When you talk about uh, the fact that uh, someone can have some child that they consider to be their son, that's that's a different category. Okay. So Amanda, you have your, your little yellow hand up there. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about the same thing, that I also had the same response to the word barren. I think it's just the terminology because a barren thing tends to be something dead, empty. It's got negative connotations, whereas a woman who hasn't got a child is none of those things. They just no, no, no. That's don't not, have a child. A, I know. It's not a woman that doesn't have a child. It means a woman who can't have a child. Or a woman, who, uh, a woman who can't have a child is not necessarily, I think the word barren has very negative okay. connotations. No, and it, I think it's, perhaps another no, word. It, no, it's an out, so. it's an outmoded, it's an outmoded yeah. archetype. So so when when you hear this <laughs> these days, people who uh, have reproductive issues they would never use the word barren. It's just, it's, an, it's a really outmoded archetype. And I would just say it really gets women's hackles up. I, I think that's what you're experiencing here. So it might be the classic example, but it is, it is not true in this day and age that a barren woman cannot have, ch have a child. We, we don't use that anymore. I'm in the mother of an adopted child. And I can tell you when somebody says, oh, is she your natural daughter? 
I, I am, they need to get away from me fast. So I'm just saying it's just an outmoded archetype. And there are these things that pop up in Buddhism and we, we, we roll with it, but it sure is nice to qualify that story a little. Um, and that's, I, I beg you, I very much beg your pardon, but yeah, yeah, as, someone, no, good, good. as an adopted child, I really have to say, say that. So, uh, uh, accepted. Uh, I, I stand uh, corrected and, uh, you know, politically correct uh, statement should be, we shouldn't use that but you understand what's being talked about here. Absolutely. I'm not, not, Absolutely. not making any kind of judgment about uh, whether a man or woman, say a man who is no longer, uh, say their uh, testicles have been removed, their whatever other, I can't remember what other organs, you know, if, they, if they've had a, um, you know, all of the reproductive organs, whether they could become a father, they could become a father now, yeah. Also today, um, one can change one's gender, uh, one can change back. I don't know if it, have you heard of anyone who's changed their gender and then changed back today? Are there people? Deidre, what do you know? What are... uh, I actually know someone who was about three quarters of the way through and changed back. So okay. I don't know if that really fits, but, yeah. but you're right. There's a lot of fluidity right now, I think. So even in the time of the Buddha, it was possible that people could change their gender. Um, there are, for instance, there is an, even a vow. If a fully ordained monk, that is a male, we use the word nun for a female uh, ordained. If a fully ordained monk were to change their gender, uh, because uh, let's, let's say if they were to break their vows Generally, it, it, as, a, as a male, if you broke your vows, uh, you, could, uh, you could not take them again, okay? That lifetime, you couldn't become a monk again. But if you changed your gender through the act of meditation and uh, other means, uh, you could become a nun that lifetime. Then if you broke those vows as a nun, uh, you couldn't become a nun again, but if you changed back to a male, you could once more become a fully ordained monk. But after that, there was no more, you couldn't become again. So that was known at that time also. And uh, I, I granted, I'll have to check the etymology of the Tibetan word. We say Moshamgi Bu. Bu means son or child. Mosham means usually translated in the dictionary as barren. So the, the idea at that time was there was no, uh, usually you wouldn't talk about this kind of son as being an adopted son. You're talking about giving the, the, the kind of son that's been given birth to. There was no in vitro fertilization. Uh, you know, those things were not known about. So that may have, you know, there was some, we have to be generous to, to understand the mindset of that time. But I, I take your point and a very good point. So anyone else have a, a thought before we end? Oh, yeah, Shanka. I was just, if I may make a recommendation, I was just, I sent it in the chat, but if, if you're interested in the four points, this is an amazing book that makes it really, really clear. Who is that by? Gen Lam Rinpa and Alan. Oh, Gen Lam Rinpa, yeah. 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 Alan well, Wallace. Ken Lambrupa was one of my teachers and uh, that book, also there's one on that he wrote on concentration. Yeah, you have that also, Charmaine, uh, or Charlene. That's a very excellent. Almost any of the Lan Rim texts that have some detail about emptiness will talk about uh, these four essential points. This is not the only way to, um, establish emptiness, but this is a very important way. So let's uh, spend a moment to dedicate at the end. We, we, at the beginning, we set a motivation at the beginning of the class this morning. In the middle, we tried to keep concentration and the, the uh, 
a virtuous state of mind. Now at the end, we try to dedicate the merits that we've created, which is a mental act, aspiring that these virtues ripen in a particular way, wishing, so mo sort of um, dedicating them to that goal of our eventual enlightenment for the sake of all sentient beings. Due to these merits, may I quickly become a Guru Buddha and lead each and every sentient being into that very same state. And I think Shanka will put up a couple of the uh, additional prayers. We already said that part out loud. So that one we just said. No, so now the the this prayer, we, we've just said this, due to these merits, uh, may I quickly achieve, attain the state of the and lead all living beings without exception to that enlightened state. And the prayer of Bodhicitta, may the supreme precious Bodhicitta, which has not arisen, arise and grow. And may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more higher and higher. You who, who uphold the subduer's moral way, who serves as a bountiful bearer of all, sustaining, preserving, and spreading Manjun, Manjunath's victorious doctrine, who masterfully accomplishes magnificent prayers honoring the three jewels, savior of myself and others, your disciples, please, please live long. And to the Dalai Lama, O wish granting, wish fulfilling jewel, source of every benefit and happiness in the world, incomparably kind Tenzin Gatso, may your holy wishes be spontaneously fulfilled. Venerable one, Lama Osel, to you whose kindness exceeds that of all the conquerors, for those wanderers in far off places, especially the West. Mindful of your loving concern for us and intentionally descending again into a family of a far distant land, we make this request. O Lama, please, please live long. And Geshe Sherab, who's re still recovering, beloved teacher, leading your students toward wisdom and compassion, explaining through exacting discernment the steps of the stages of the path. You are the unequaled guide Please live a long and stable life. So thank you. Oh, I can see Ani now. Ani, you were just you were not there before. Let's good to see you. Um, thanks for everyone attending. I thought incredibly dynamic. I'm glad that uh, Deidre brought up and uh, who else? You know, uh, Nancy and others brought up these points. And uh, thank you for attending hope to see you next week uh if you if you're interested we're, you can still join in the low rate class by watching the first few episodes on youtube but uh hope to see you again next week have a good week <laughs>